and thank you very much uh, for inviting me today uh, to speak at the Carpentries Conference. I feel really privileged and it's really nice to meet the community in person and to see how many friendly people, supportive people among you are here today. And I really enjoyed all my conversation that I had with every single one of you. So thank you very much for that and thank you for your trust in giving me this opportunity to speak to you today and keep the keynote presentation. And uh, just wanted to say that my talk is going to be about data, but hopefully I will also be able to talk a little bit more, going a little bit beyond uh, data, also talking a little bit about code, which I guess will be of interest to you as the audience of the Carpentry Connect. And really, the topic is how can we try to provide researchers with the support they need. And the picture that you see in here is the place where I work. This is TU Delft Library. TU Delft is Technical University of Delft, and it's a university in the Netherlands. It's a very small country, and it's a small city. And we have this library with this cone to show people, yes, here, here we are, here we can come. And especially nowadays, with the very, because we have the heat wave in Europe, all the students or researchers, if anything, they are attracted by our rooftop terrace. So we can, you know, we invite them to come to the library. So hopefully, you know, we try everything we can to make researchers come to us. And the slides are available. So if any of you would like to see the slides earlier or follow the links as I'm going to talk, you can download them from the Zenoto. And I think they're also on the Slack channel for the Carbon Peace Conference. And just before the, I start, I would also like to say a couple of disclaimers just to manage your expectations and <laughs> not to, to make sure that, that you know what I can and what I cannot. So first of all, I'm, I'm not going to aim to tell you about the services we provide that you does for data support or for coding support, frankly speaking, because I thought that would make the presentation somewhat boring, I hope you agree. And Instead of that, I would like to talk about like entirely, completely, personally biased selections of things that I think are somewhat cool and hopefully maybe some of you will find at least some of those things interesting. And another thing that I have to admit that the world that I will be talking about, uh, you know, in the, I guess, contrary to what Lex was talking about, his experiences, the work that I'm going to be talking about is not done by me, it's almost exclusively done by the others. And wherever credit is due, I will do my best to give credit to those people who actually do all the hard work. And I'm almost sure, and I already know, that I will most likely fail because there are so many people involved in all the different you know, little steps as we talk that lead to the bigger picture. And I guess my role in that, as Malika was talking yesterday, I'm this sort of generalist trying to bring the community together. So I'm actually not using you know, any special expertise to, to try to teach people the carpentries, for example. And finally, and I think it's also important, so be patient with me if I fail. I'm not coding myself, so I'm new to the community, and I hope you will be giving, have some patience for me. If you ask me some difficult technical questions, I might have to refer you to those experts that actually do the work. So just to be very honest. And to start the actual presentations, I have a question for you, and if you can raise your hands, who have heard about fair principles? Wow, everybody, you're amazing, that's really incredible, thank you so much. <laughs> awesome, so I have another question for you, since you already know so much. Who, and please be honest, would feel comfortable explaining what fair data really means in practice to another researcher from your discipline? There are some wonderful. That's great. I mean, that, that's really a lot. I'm, I'm really impressed that there was like nothing five hands. That, that's wonderful. And why I'm showing this and asking these two questions, I just wanted to, you are actually really amazing audience. You know so much about open science, about sharing, about interoperability, about programming. So I think you are the exception. I just wanted to show you a reality check that was a survey done with like, let's say, random selection of researchers, not those attending uh, Carpentry Connect. And the survey was basically asking researchers, more than 700 of them, whether they were familiar with fair principles. And in the graph, you can see different disciplines, and the green ones are those people who said that yes, they were familiar with fair principles. The yellow ones were, I guess, the, the, the first question that we've asked. They were somewhat familiar, but maybe weren't exactly sure what that means. 
But basically what it means is that about overall, about 20% of researchers said they were familiar with pair principles. So we can say that the majority of researchers, they don't even know, have never heard about it, what the hell it is. And probably since you have heard about pair principles, everybody is now asking researchers to make their data, their code fair. We have the founders' expectation, we have the university policies, we have the journal's expectations. And just my reflection on that, that I think it's greatly unfair. I think it's really not fair towards the researcher that we are expecting people to do all those things, we have all those policies in place, and really people don't have that appropriate support to even understand what do we mean by those principles and who understands, you know, there are a handful of individuals who actually know what they mean. So I think we have to be a little bit more realistic and take a step back when you think about the support we need to provide and also the expectations that we have on our research community. So just as outline for my talk before I start talking about the support we provide, it's just a hope that we can think about fair principles as a sort of a moving target. You know, we are all on a journey, and that's a journey to get there. It will take time, certainly, and uh, probably for some at least, that will be a lot of effort, and it's not always easy. And I think we should acknowledge that when we think about the support we provide to our community. So now, coming to the main point of my presentation, and what I would like to talk about is a case study from my university, from TU Delft, and just giving a couple of examples how we strive to provide what we think might be good support to our researchers. And again, I'll be very biased when talking about a couple of examples, so if you have any questions, I will be delighted to answer them during the break, during lunchtime, or please grab me whenever you like. And we have three principles behind our mostly data support, and I'll explain later why did I put data into brackets. So first of the objective is to really help researchers to improve their daily practice and not to think about compliance. So that's not really to make sure we increase compliance rate or whatever we can show on the paper. Our institutions is great. We have 100% data deposits or something. That's really not the case. We would like to reach out to people and make sure that daily practices are better. And just one reflection, this makes me scary. I don't know if it makes other people scary, but you know, there is a group of people who are pushing for these fair principles. I know they're talking with founders and they come up with all sorts of fair metrics, you know, fair frameworks, individual groups use the framework to create metrics, registry of metrics, and then metrics assessment, fairness assessment, that somehow really, you know, makes me scared. I think maybe that's good to have some idealistic vision of the horizon, but I think we should be really careful before these things get into the agenda, especially of funding bodies or some executive boards within institutions. So just to make things clear. And our second principle behind the support we'd like to provide that we would always like to put researchers and research in the central place in our support. So the aim is not really to come and tell researchers, this is how you must be doing research from now on. It's just to meet you wherever you are. You are the expert on your research. And how can we help you a little bit to make your research a bit better, a bit more efficient? And for that, we thought it's really important to provide discipline-specific support. Otherwise, sort of generic, generic support from the central library, we thought that maybe that would be a bit less le relevant to our research community. So what we did, and I guess it might sound a bit controversial, we had some pushback from the library communities. However, this actually came from our library. So I have to say that our library was quite sensible, I think, in what they wanted to achieve. What we did with eight faculties at the Delft, and I think in the UK nomenclature it, it's equivalent to schools or uh, like bigger units which gather several departments. We have eight of them at the Delft. At each one of them we have appointed a dedicated data steward, and those are people who are really researchers, who basically finish their PhD or postdocs, or equivalent experience, as it happens, we have people who all have a PhD degree, but that wasn't, what we wanted is people who really understand the research practices within the faculties, and who had passion for good data management for open science and wanted to do something different. So we've hired those people, we provided them with training on data management, 
And these are the individuals that would go to the faculties and try to help researchers to improve their daily practices. And how do we do that? And the third, that comes back to the third important point, and I'm really glad to see Lex's presentation beforehand because it really resonated well with the messages I'm trying to say. That what we are trying to do in our approach towards our researchers is to really focus on very small incremental steps which are realistic to them. So to give people a helpful hand in changing their practice and also understanding that there are no stupid questions. So of course, community differs and needs differ. Also within TU Delft, we have some researchers like yourselves, like those who are really innovators and advancing the field, who are experts in what they're doing, who know how to deal with code, how to deal with data. And very often, actually, we can't support those people. We just can give them a tap in the shoulder. You are great, you know, you are really an expert. We can learn from you. What can you tell us that we can try to amplify within the community? but also to make sure that those people who are really confused perhaps or don't even dare to ask questions have the courage to come and ask questions. And here I mean some professors that for example had like a bunch of USB sticks and we really have some of those and that's the only way they store the research data, you know. How can we help them? And I guess here the really big improvement is if they stop using those USB sticks because they realize that there is free, backed up, accessible everywhere storage provided by the university. They are extremely happy. They would come to other people and say, those people really helped me. How about you come and see how they can help with you? So really, we, can be, we have to be very tailored to our audience and what are the little steps for them? So in summary, what do the data stewards do? And we like to use this analogy of a general practitioner doctor. So again, generalist. So thank you, Malvika, for the uh, explanation of the importance roles of generalists. So even though they have the research background and understanding, they can connect with researchers and understand their problems. They actually act as our general practitioner doctors for data and sometimes code questions actually as well. So whatever questions, whatever doubts, confusion researchers might have, these are the first contact points. We just tell them, go to those people. And our aim is to solve around 80% of questions, queries, problems that researchers come up with uh, on the spot by the data steward. And in 20% of cases, they will be referring uh, those researchers to some other experts within the university. But I think the great advantage is that researchers don't have to have the pain of trying to navigate. You know, I'm sure that you've seen some university pages Ours is horrible, really, to try to find who is the right person at different departments providing support, especially with these new GDPR requirements and so on and so forth. It sometimes can be really daunting. So at least that hassle is taken away from researchers. We as data stewards, we are connected well with the other support services, and it's quite easy for us to approach colleagues in other departments to seek their expertise. And the second part of their job is they do lots of advocacy and training. And by advocacy, and I sort of I hinted out before, it's not only, it is their job as well to organize some open session, for example, we tell you about open science, or we organize a workshop on software carpentry for you, but also to identify those people who don't want to come to those sessions, who think that's a waste of time, who think, oh, I don't have data, leave me alone, or I don't have any problems, so you can't help me at all. So actually, also to reach out to those people and having them permanently installed, let's say, within the faculty, that really helps them to build those connections and build trust. So you have a lot of serendipity in interactions. Sometimes they say, oh, I have met this person in the lift, you know, and in the lift, you, it's only two of you, you travel together for a couple of minutes, you know, you can have a conversation. We don't know each other yet. I'm your data steward, how can I help you? Can I come to your office? And very often, you know, when you have these personal interactions, that's really difficult to a person smiling and willing to help you. No, no, I don't want your support. You know, you can ignore emails, but if somebody approaches you personally, that is a completely different conversation. So we really try to benefit from that. I don't want to spend all the time talking to you about data stewardship because I wanted to also mention some other stuff. But if you're interested about like data stewardship as a model, there is really a nice report from the National Coordination Point for Research Data by some of my Dutch colleagues. And I think if that's something that appeals to you at least a little bit, that's really a must read. And if some of you are interested, I received from those colleagues a printed copy. I normally don't have printed copies, 
but since I got one, I took it with me on the plane and I read the report. So if anybody would like to get that coffee, I'm more than happy to make sure we don't cut trees and we are sustainable. So I will be delighted to give you my printed copy if you would like to read the report. So just introducing the other uh, uh, point of what we do at, at Delft, what I would like to tell you about, is reflecting on the fact that the data stewards, as I mentioned, they really know their researchers. And if you would look at the diffusion of innovations, that's like a quite an old concept now. Whenever we do something new, we always have a lot of laggards, we have lots of people in the middle, but we also have those innovators. Sorry, I actually realized my pointer doesn't work, but it doesn't matter. So the laggards, you know, obviously I gave you some examples of the professor that, that have a bunch of USB sticks or they don't know what to do. But we also have these innovators and by being installed within the community, you really easily identify those people. They are already there. They are doing all this amazing stuff. You are part of those innovators. So for the data stewards, it's great to con get connected with those people. And what do we do with them? So we started a data champions community. And I have to admit that this idea is completely stolen from colleagues from the University of Cambridge. And actually within the room, you have two data champions from Cambridge. It's Kirsty and Hugo down there, if you can raise your hands. And if you like to have some questions to those people, they are really the innovators from the University of Cambridge where I was before. So basically we decided, oh, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. This seems to be working at Cambridge. We'll steal that program and do something very similar at, at TU Delft. So that's what we did. And basically our community of data champions is a group of local advocates who are who appear to be learning, spreading, you know, fertilizing those ideas within departments and communities. And I think it's quite important because, you know, one thing is even if it's a data steward who has the trust, that's one thing, but then if you have the data steward who sometimes mention to somebody in the lift, you know, maybe you can do that. And on the other hand, you also have a researcher who gives them really good practice. I think together we can really inspire and do a lot. And for them, what a couple of them already said, so we have now uh, 45 plus. I initially thought I would put all the images there, but then I gave up because it's 45 people and I had to format all the pictures. <laughs> so my apologies, again, I failed to acknowledge everybody. One of the data stewards is actually sort of coordinating the community. But the most important aspect, of, and many of them reflected on that, was the networking part. They can get connected, like as you are here at Carpentry Connect, they have this local community at UDEL, and they said that actually helped them a lot to get inspired what else we can do, what other cool stuff other colleagues from other departments are doing. Oh, I did not know you before. What you're doing is really helpful for my research. So that idea of cross fertilization has been very helpful. And just to say we have no entry requirements to become a data champion. So basically anyone who wishes to be part of the community is the right person. They are welcome to be one of the data champions. You don't have to feel like you know you are a superhero. You are a superhero just if you want to join our community of data champions. The only thing we are actually thinking about is to create some code of conduct currently. So that's something that we are considering and I might have discussed this with you uh, over dinner yesterday. And the whole principle is because these are innovators who would like to give them some recognition and you know the rewards we can offer them, promote their work that they are doing anyway. And just some examples of what those data champions do, even though nothing has been required of them. So for example, again, that's a very bottom-up approach. Those uh, two guys, Anton and Guy and uh, Gary Steele from uh, the quantum nanoscience department at UDEL, they just thought researchers need some guidance, you know, okay, there are these very aspiring, very inspirational, fair principles, we like to share our researcher, but what should we do? What do we tell PhD students who join our departments? What they should do with their data whenever they publish papers? What should they do if they code? So they came up, again, organically, we just realized that they are doing this, so we promoted this, this work a little bit with their own internal policy on what they would like to share among each other. That's again a bottom-up approach, it's not something imposed by the university, as a minimal set of requirements, guiding principles for the whole department. And there are many other examples that I don't have the time to expand on, I'm more than happy to do it if you like during a break or during the question time. But other crucial thing for us is that Data Champions Street, because these are those innovators, they are ahead of us, they know more than we do, they do tell us what kind of support is needed by researchers. 
And that's why what I always put the data in bracket actually can really help us to think about what else should we be doing with our support from the central university, from the data steward side. So they really stress that if we care about reproducibility, and that's, I guess, the mission and vision behind all our data support, we can't just think about data because data can't be without code. They are really closely close related to each other, even if you share the data most beautifully, but the code needed to process the data is not there. What can I do with your data? That becomes obsolete. So they really helped us to understand that if we want to be thorough and if we really want to practice what we preach, we need to expand our services. So we really took these messages aboard and some of my colleagues, the trio of really wonder women that you can see on the pictures on the side, they've been doing lots of workshops and discussions with those researchers willing to talk with us and provide feedback about how should we best support software reproducibility, how we should put it into practice. The full report is available, they even published a paper on that, I have to say. But the conclusions were sort of daunting at the beginning because they said, oh, we should need a research software engineer in every group. And like, how do we do that? You know, as a university, we don't have that bunch of money, you know, from the sky. So how, how we should be putting this reproducibility into practice? And I have to say, and then, it would be a big embarrassment to Mateusz, whom I can see in the audience, that the carpentries, and especially Mateusz, who is down there, if you want to raise your hand and be even more embarrassed, Mateusz is there. He really gave us a massively helpful hand. So we've been struggling with this idea, what should we do? And I think it was also yesterday, I don't remember who mentioned that in your talk, but you spoke about regional representatives and the people who really can bridge the communities. I'm not sure if Mateusz is one of them formally, but he is the person informally. He did such a wonderful job for us, you know, to tell us, oh, I just try it out with carpentries. I can find you instructors, don't worry, you know. And like, I even for me, a person who doesn't do coding, like this whole idea of the carpentries was sort of a bit overwhelming. What are the trainers? What are the instructors? What is the library carpentry? Like, I sort of was difficult to put my head around that. And then Mateusz said, oh, just don't worry, just let me do a workshop with you for free, you know, we just come, you know, just put a venue together, you see what you think about this. And I have to say, that was extremely helpful, you know, his trust in us and his trust in the organization and the power that was actually how much, you know, new ideas it can lead to. And what I was saying at the beginning, oh, you know, actually I'm interested in like building the capacity, we need more instructors in the Netherlands, like, yeah, 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 of course, we can give you more instructors, and I thought like, that's going to never happen. But actually, Mateusz was extremely clever, and I really have to say, listen to people who have more expertise who, and who know more than you and take a helpful hand whenever it's offered to you. When we organized this workshop, like the demand was huge. So the first workshop had 37 people on the waiting list. And I also have to say, we haven't advertised the workshop at all. We sort of put it on the even right. I'm not sure how people found about it, but like within a day since we made it public, oh my God, you know, we have this. So we thought, okay, let's do the second one. We did the second one, but we thought, okay, we tell those people on the waiting list about the workshop. Within a day, again, we had 83 people on the waiting list. So actually, Mateusz had a very good idea. He demonstrated to us, to our executive board, like we need to do something about this, and carpentry seems what people want. So we became gold members of the carpentries, and again, Mateusz was a great person leading this thing forward, and he was hinting that we might want to have instructors in the Netherlands. Indeed, what we thought that we should make sure that all our data stewards can become instructors of the carpentries, and on top of the training that they do on data management, they should also offer the training on software carpentries and data carpentries. So we now already have seven instructors, and there will be more coming, because as gold members we can have up to 15. And if any of you ever needs to get some help with doing workshops, we are happy indeed to uh, you know, lend you our instructors, so hopefully they can help other institutions. And I also have to give credit to my colleague Paula, whose picture is down there. She's really overseeing it as a coordinator of all our instructor network at UDEL. So, those people who became instructors were not only data stewards, but some of the data champions. They were very keen on that idea, and we thought like, well, if you are keen, you know, just become an instructor. They were really, really happy about it. But this doesn't come without problems, and I was really grateful for Tracy's talk uh, yesterday. 
And Tracy highlighted a couple of issues which I think are quite important to discuss. Like, first of all, whenever we teach data, whenever we teach code, it needs to be relevant to the learners. And the skills, the perspectives should be relevant to the current work of the attendees. Instructors should be current in the field, and we should be teaching current tools. And I have to say, while people, like when we always ask for feedback, and again, as Lex said, you know, looking at feedback is always really encouraging and helpful, but we also try to look at room for further improvement. And indeed, there were voices after the carpentries that people, oh, that sounds so cool, but how do I do with it with my data and my code? How do I really put it into practice? So again, and again, big credit to my colleague Paula and all this bunch of people that helped to put it this off this ground. Paula had this idea that how about, you know, within our, within our data champions, innovators, we already have a huge community of experts like yourself who are interested in these topics. We have instructors because we just train them. So how about we team up our instructors with those data champions, with these innovators we have in the field, and try to deliver some more disciplinary workshops. So again, here we try to use the existing carpentry lessons to deliver the first genomics data carpentry, which again was hugely popular. And because we've been teaching that to the communities that already existed, you know, those people were cross-fertilizing ideas between themselves and then when they come back to the lab, we hope that they will be able to put them into their daily practices. And what I really would like to praise my colleague Paula and her approach, you know, she always, she never, I mean, we, we had the talk about saying no, but actually she's really a yes person in a different aspect, like yes and no. So, you know, if you would like to have a workshop on a certain topics within your disciplines, no, we will not create it for you, but if you help us a bit, you know, if you give us the experts, then yes, we can do it together, you know, we'll provide the framework, we'll help you turn it to a carpentry style workshops, we'll see what kind of lessons are relevant, and we'll give you the instructors, but we need the help from you as well, so, no, but yes, you know, like, how can we turn a no into a yes? And another example of that was actually a group of researchers who for whatever weird reasons were working with Fortran and they said, oh, that's what we have to do and we need to get some more expertise in Fortran. So, okay, you know. But then again, they were wondering, can we provide training? And our answer is, do you have people who would like to do that within your community? And indeed, we are now working with them to see what we can do to teach people some Fortran, which is a bit crazy, but you know, they need it for whatever reasons of efficiency of the high performance processing, I think. But we also, at the same time, you know, like we can do those carpentry classes dedicated to certain disciplines. That is a problem of scale, you know. So sometimes how many different courses you can develop and how much time it takes to actually develop <coughs> such courses. So we are also looking for some more informal ways to support our researchers uh, with their code and with their data needs. And what we came up with is this coding lunch and data crunch idea. So. We do these monthly drop-in sessions that's open for two hours to anybody who would like to get some advice on their data, code, or whatever. We give them food as well, so that comes back to the idea about eating cake first. So we do feed our researchers who come in there, or at least try to give them a thank you. And we try to rotate it. So we have several departments, several faculties, and probably, you know, from your institutions, each faculty, each department, it's own kingdom. And it's sometimes difficult to motivate people, you know, to drop in to another faculty, to sit on, get on their bike and cycle for five minutes. No, they would not do that. So we try to come to them with this drop-in session. We always advertise them. We always mention that we are going to be there in this particular faculty. And uh, the people who are offering those consultations are always the data stewards plus those data champions who are available at the time, and actually what we also quite noticed and that was interesting, that many other service providers who saw these adverts, they came, oh, actually, I know a lot about HPC. Maybe I can come along and offer support as well. So, you know, that's really amazing and impressive because during these coding consultations, actually the learners are not only those people who come with problems, but actually, also us, you know, I'm learning a lot from the problems that researchers come up with, from the experts present in the room, and I think it's really amazing how we can help people and help each other. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say, so that's just a picture of how it works, and I have to say that idea actually came from one of our data stewards, that's why I put his picture over there, and now my colleague Paula is trying to organize it. 
But what is quite interesting that you know we are not also always able to help people with everything. Sometimes it turns out that the problems that they have, two hours is actually not sufficient to solve it. But that's okay because I think 50% of issues we are able to solve on the spot. For the other 50%, we at least got connected so we can solve it, you know, while talking with you and working with you further and gathering the other experts who are necessary to solve the problem. But I'm really happy because people keep coming and we keep organizing this and it seems like more and more interest around that idea. So we do it on a monthly basis. And another thing that I would like to say, and that's not again, not something that I took part in, our other colleagues from the library had research and development team and they were trying to see what else the library could do to make it even more helpful to researchers. And they've been toying with lots of different ideas, doing lots of consultations with researchers and it came to the fact, you know, that you probably heard lots of groups that are doing lots of computational analysis. They somehow, one way or the other, get the access to the expertise. In the Netherlands, we're quite privileged. We have an organization called eScience Center, which actually offer research software engineers that you can pay for and get their support for the projects. I mean, you have to write a mini grant, and then if that's successful, you will get that support, and that researchers really value that. However, this is accessible usually to people who already do computational research, who know the value of a research software engineer, and who have some sort of reputation that they can write a good grant proposal. How do we support PhD students, you know, who are isolated within their groups, who would not write such a big proposal, or whose PI don't even care about coding? So those people have been doing lots of interviews with various stakeholders, also those which are less privileged, you know, so wouldn't be shouting, wouldn't be applying for grants, who are usually hiding somewhere in their labs, you know, what can we do, how can we help you? And they came up with this idea of a coding assistant pilot. So basically uh, how it works, they implemented one of the uh, library colleagues who is our software developer in one of the faculties for a month period just to see what's going to come up with. It's just started in June, so it's a very new idea. And what kind of support does that person, the coding assistant, offer? So if you're an experienced programmer, you're somewhere stuck, you have no idea where or how, how do I solve my problem, he's going to help you. Or if you would like to, you you're doing lots of coding and somehow it sort of became unwidely, you know, what can you do to manage your code better? He is the person who can help you to get started or you're completely new to the programming, you don't know how to start or with which, which language to start, again, these are those people that can help you uh, with or any other issues, you, if you've been trying to solve it, you think it must have been easy, it wasn't, you've been trying to solve the problem for a couple of hours, just come to me. And what I think is really cool that uh, he also put his agenda online, so if you would click on this QR code or go to there, it will be I'm not interested in doing this because you will not pop over to his office. But I think it's quite nice for researchers that it's very welcoming, very open and transparent. Just come, whenever I don't have an appointment with another person, my agenda is always open to you. So I'm really curious to see what's going to happen. It started on the 17th of June, so it will close on 17th of July, and then we'll evaluate if that's something that researchers thought was helpful. So I'm coming to an end of my talk, and just a couple of summary notes that I would like to share with you. And the first one, and again, big credit uh, to my boss, Alistair, who is the head of our team of research data support services, who always say that perhaps, you know, we as institutions shouldn't be focusing so much on infrastructure and technical solutions. But think about the people. Do we have the right people? Or can we, you know, help people to become the right people? And I think it's very empowering, you know, that really caring about the colleagues that you're working with. And another actually that's more of an issue that I would like to discuss with you, uh, that people really need to be rewarded for their work. And, you know, very often I put it on the side, but we every now and then we have questions from researchers, oh, you are a data steward, can you fix my printer? <laughs> or can you install this software on my computer? No, that's not part of the job. But then, you know, sometimes then it leads to disappointment. Oh, if that's not what you do, then you are a waste of money for this university. You know, maybe I'm exaggerating, people are usually happy, but, you know, I think it's quite important that people are clear about their job description and can be proud of the work that they are doing and feel acknowledged for the work that they are doing. And at the moment, there is no like job description, you know, agreed job profile for a data steward that could allow people to be agreed on their task and to ensure that they have a clear career progression. This also comes back to the salary issue, the very practical issue that I'm struggling with because, you know, I'm the person who has to hire the team and then 
suddenly everybody wants to have data stewards. We have those trained people who are the first data stewards. And what if somebody you know offers slightly higher salary? So thankfully, people like the team, so they seem to be willing to stay. Of course, I realize that they should move on at some point. That's good for their careers if they wish to. So of course, but I think it's get to, good to have some sort of structure that we are fair with how do we remunerate the people and offer them a clear career progression path. So what we did, that's currently a very much work in progress, like draft 1.0, revisions are certainly going to be anticipated, but at least for our clarity, we put together this document that describes, at least for our own understanding, the roles of different data professionals and code professionals at UDAL. So if somebody is not clear or ask a data steward to fix their printers, we can always send it to them, look like it's actually not what they do, they do something else, which is very great, you know, they can help you with some other things. And another thing, and that's also Lex was talking a lot about is that people should feel supported, and that's coming back also to that email thing. We have a Slack channel between our data stewards, and it's being really heavily used, and I think it's good that it's being heavily used because it hugely reduces email load, so I can certainly recommend it to every team. But also, the data stewards say that they treat it as a sort of first, you know, if they have any doubts, or they don't know how to deal with a situation, or not sure who is the right person to ask questions, that's always the first place they go to. They put the question to their colleagues, to other experts. And they always, whenever, you know, we have these discussions, they always mention, my data steward team is actually really, you know, my first network of support that I'm turning to, and I think that's really important. So for this, you know, for to make sure that people that within the data stewards, because they have based at different faculties, so they don't see each other on a daily basis, and they have to still be acting as a team. So my job was also to make sure that they feel like a team, that they share the same values, that they trust each other. So I can't really stress the importance of how really crucial it is for us. We have weekly meetings, and some people at the beginning were saying, oh, it's too much, you know, we should have them once a month. Now people are saying that having weekly meetings and two hours spent every week for just meetings and people, you know, coming with their issues or telling what they are doing at their faculties, they say, oh, maybe that's not enough, maybe we should hear them more frequently. I'm sort of against that idea because I think we should also spend some time doing other stuff. But actually, that's really important that people feel like they can offer each other some support and some guidance. I also have one-to-one uh, -one meetings with all the data stewards just to make sure if there are some issues that they can't share with everybody or they need some more personal support or suggestions about their professional development they at least have a person to turn to on top of their normal line managers, which I know. We have, of course, Christmas parties, away days, and any other occasions to celebrate, you know, submitted papers, published papers, going to a conference, giving presentations, whatever we can. And I would also like to mention recognition of the volunteer work. So I mentioned the data champions who are, again, they are volunteering their time. They are doing that anyway, as I mentioned, but I think it's nice if whatever we can, we can recognize their work. So we are quite lucky because, um, again, on the 17th of June, we have a volunteer, a PhD student from Nottingham, who wanted to do something else for her internship. So she's coming for three months to promote the work of the data champions and write some case studies about all the cool stuff that they are doing. But also that's important that we recognize the work of that volunteers, recognizing the work of the volunteers. So, you know, I can't stress it enough. I think saying thank you and making people feel important and recognizing how important is their work, you know, no matter how small it is, like within the scale of things at the university, it really makes a huge difference. So I'm really grateful to have Connie in our team. And some really final, final, version last of final reflections. I think what's really important, and perhaps some of us shy away, is to really accept support. So again, thank you to Mateusz. I'm really grateful for that, but sometimes, you know, that helpful hand in whatever occasions that you might encounter really can make an immense difference to yourself. And that's no point of reinventing the wheel. If somebody is more expert than you, don't shy away and accept that support. I think that's really important. But also give a helpful hand. So if anybody asks you for support, even if you can offer a little, because we are all really busy people, that sometimes can make a huge difference to, to others. So we should also remember that if we take, we should also give a helpful hand to the others. And come, like, I was, it was so funny to see that in you know, like one of your opening slides, actually, I really wanted to reiterate that those small steps 
can really make a huge difference, or even if it's not huge, well, actually I've deleted huge in the end, because, you know, making a difference is important. I don't think how small or how huge it is. Really, every little step matters. And I think that's it from me. Thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, I know that I've been sort of superficially going through all of those different things. I um, will be delighted to answer your questions. Thank you so much. coordinator role and how that emerged um, at your university. So that was actually, again, all the credit goes to my boss, not to me, but indeed he thought that if we have those people at different faculties, as I mentioned, if we don't bring them back together, that's going to fall apart sooner or later. And I guess that's the same thing as you think about, you know, the carpentries, like you have to professionalize it, you have to organize it as a central level, otherwise if it's nobody's responsibility to keep the tab on everything that's happening. How a team by itself organically, spontaneously is supposed to work on sharing values or recognize each other? I think it's important that it's actually somebody's work, somebody's job description to take care of the team. On top of that, I have to say I'm doing lots of other things within the university, but I guess it, it's normal, you know, and I should be doing those other things. I should be helping other service providers. But also an important thing, I guess, in my role is that whenever data stewards encounter any issues, that say, I don't know, legal team is not really helpful, you know, that's my job to have discussions with the legal team to see how they can be more supportive. So we as the team of data stewards can really rely on their help and expertise. So that's, I think it's essential, and like many people in other places, they now think the report actually also stresses the one that I was referring to, the important role of coordination of all those different positions. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering what incentives do you have to uh, recruit data champions? We have uh, several actually. So as I mentioned, like first of all, the most important thing we try to advertise is the network. And indeed, a couple of them already told us, oh, you know, all this idea of these professors who's organizing data labs, you know, that really inspired me. I'm now doing these things at my faculty. I already not realize that this person is using a similar method. Maybe we can collaborate. So I think that that really matters to people, you know, that they have like-minded individuals that they can work with. But also, in terms of other rewards that we offer, we, of course, offer them recognition. And we try to do it within our own reasons. So for example, at many of the faculties, um, people took initiative to recognize data champions within, we have this, I'm sure you have this yearly progress review at most of the universities. We also have it, we call it RNO cycles within the Dutch universities. That this can be mentioned within those cycles. So supervisors are asking researchers, what do you do in terms of data management? So if you are a data champion, that's of course an excellent contribution which they will recognize. So a couple of faculties are doing that. And as I mentioned also, I haven't actually said about this, we also have a travel fund and fund for organizing workshops. So a couple of data champions actually joined the Rust collaborations workshop. Maybe you remember Victor, he was remembering some of you, so he was quite jealous that I'm coming to this <laughs> conference. But that's also helps people, you know, so they, they take this money to come to a conference and collaborate with people like yourself. And then they do mention to the others, thanks to that, Data Champions Travel Fund, I was able to do all these cool things. So I think these are you know, small things. We don't have any financial incentives, but hopefully every little helps. Thank you, Marta. Um, <laughs>